Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenebeck on Bloomberg Radio. Well, our next guest is a technology and healthcare futurist, served in the U.S. National Security Council, State Department, and Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and with the United Nations in Cambodia. Most recently, he, or more recently, I should say, he has been exploring and explaining the world of genetic engineering. We are talking about Jamie Metzl. He's the author of Hacking Dor- Darwin, Genetic Engineering and the Future of Humanity, four other books he has also written. He was a member of the World Health Organization Expert Advisory Committee on Human Genome Editing. We want to get to it because he is with us. He's Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council, Founder and Chair of the nonprofit One Shared World. His new book out, is called Super Convergence, How the Genetics, Biotech, and AI Revolutions Will Transform Our Lives, World, and Work work and world. Jamie is in New York City and the book is out Tuesday. Forgive me, Jamie. I'm kind of rushing to get to you because I want (laughs) to talk to you. How are you? I'm great, Carol. Great to hear your voice. We've been at this together for many years, so it's great to be together again. Well, what do you think about that journey and what you are kind of focusing on at this point and really tackling some really big areas and kind of putting them together and the importance of kind of thinking about them together? And I mean genetics, biotech, and AI. Yeah, so this book in many ways, it's the culmination kind of my entire life. Um, And I'm trying to ask the question um, is what do we do and how do we manage these two most fundamental transformations of our lives? And those two transformations are this is the moment after 3.8 billion years of, of life on Earth that our one species has developed these two transformational superpowers. And that's we are creating novel intelligence and have developed the capacity to recast all of life, including our own. And the one question that's going to determine whether our species thrives in the future or doesn't is whether we can use these new godlike superpowers wisely. And again, Carol, you mentioned my last book, Hacking Darwin, Mm -hmm. was all about the future of human genetic engineering. And then I was, as you and I have discussed, deeply involved in the issues of uh, pandemic origins. I was a member of the World Health Organization Expert Committee on Human Genome Editing after the first CRISPR babies were born. And so I definitely am deeply involved in the science of what these intersecting AI genetics and biotechnology revolutions mean. And then the applications, healthcare, agriculture, manufacturing, uh, data storage, and, and lots of other things. But then the question is, well, how do we do it? And so one is we need to be very cognizant of the dangers, which mm-hmm. are very real. And then we need to say, what's the path forward? How do we do this wisely? And what are the building blocks of getting to the place where we want to be? Because if we get this right, we can have much better health care, uh, more abundant foods for everybody ar- around the world and all kinds of wonderful things. And if we get it wrong, right. we can get symbio pandemics, we can crash <sighs> ecosystems, we can undermine our very humanity. And that's why I've written a book for everyone. I want people to take this book to the beach and be comfortable and having fun reading it on, on the beach. They go, that was a really easy read, but I actually learned a lot and it sparked a lot of meaningful conversation. I have to say that I have been watching though a video you did um, where you talked about the book. You're in San Jose, California. You're competing in an ultra marathon. It's raining. There's lots of mud. We're actually showing it uh, for our viewers right now. You talk about your hands getting numb. Um, you're sniffling because it's cold. It's raining. Are you, are you walking or running, it's, Jamie? Just uh, to clarify here. It looks, well, like, you're, I, it looks like you're I, walking. Can I say, I am so honored that you are <laughs> sharing this with your viewers. So for those of you who don't do ultra marathons, ultra marathons are hard. An ultra marathon is a race longer than a marathon. The ones mm-hmm. that I do are 50 kilometer, 30, uh, 30 um, uh, two mile races and I do mountain trail runs. And I was in San Jose speaking at Synbio Beta, which is the big synthetic biology conference that my friend John Cumbers runs. And I thought, oh, this is going to be easy. Famous last words. I'm just going to go the day before the conference and I'll run this race. <laughs> San Jose, the weather's perfect. How big could the hills be? <laughs> so it turns out the hills were pretty big. And it turned out they had this uncharacteristic freezing like rainy slushy storm and it was like uh, I mean you, you I'm so much older than you guys but you know what a, a three hour tour means when you yeah we know. It's gonna be, oh, we know this is gonna be easy <laughs> Kill Island. It was like a three it was a three hour tour 
And so then I knew that I, I had to, somebody had asked me to record a video about the book and I was walking up this hill at mile like 30 and it was a kind of this straight up, you know, I'm just, what can I do? Are you record that? It was. It's like you're insane at those moments. I, I'm going to record a you record a video about this book. That seems like a good idea. So I did it. And well, there you go. I was thinking though, watching it, and I was like, it feels. You know, you know when you're out in nature, you sometimes for me, my brain opens up. I think differently, maybe more clearly about some of the big ideas and trends and innovations, yeah. disruptions, whatever the heck you want to call them, that are coming at us big time. How do you cross nature? with some of these dynamic trends that are coming us that will clearly tra test kind of natural evolutionary theory that has dominated oh for God. so long. This is why you're such a great journalist, Carol, to make such a smooth transition as that one. I and mean, what I'll say is the things that we call nature aren't natural. If huh. you go to Whole Foods and mm -hmm. go to the fruits and vegetables section, you would be hard pressed to find a fruit or a vegetable that 20,000 years ago existed wow. in anything like oh, its wild. current form. It almost doesn't exist. Maybe there's one or two things. If you, like when I was out hiking in San Jose, oh, it seemed like nature because there were a lot of trees. But Nave, if we mean by nature what it was like before humans changed everything, like no one went hiking just for fun because the saber tooth hiker will eat you <laughs> if you do that. And so the thing that we call nature is just the world that our ancestors managed and manipulated. Like your your dog, that your dog didn't exist 50,000 years ago in this um, right. uh, there was no this, in this format. No, none of it, exactly. <laughs> and so what and and even if you are the most indigenous farmer in the highlands of Peru make it, making growing quinoa from ancient varieties of seeds, you are a radical biotechnologist. Much more, the difference between the precursors to our domesticated crops and our current non-GMO corn and our current GMO corn, the, the, the difference between the, 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 the precursors and corn is mm -hmm. way more than the minuscule difference <laughs> between current corn and, and, and GMO. So, so the, the starting point for this has to be the choice that we are making as a species is not natural like, okay. versus unnatural. It's how do we interact with the living world that we have been managing and manipulating for thousands of years and do so in the smartest, most economical, safest, most sustainable way to achieve the things that we want to achieve. And what are those things? Well, we don't want to die of terrible cancer. We want to have gene therapy. So somebody who's born with something like sickle cell disease Right. rather than living a life of excruciating pain and then dying prematurely mm -hmm. can live a normal life. We want to grow more crops on less land to feed more people. So Jamie, I, I, my question for you is after doing the research and reporting for this book and your other books, how do you live your life differently? What do you eat mm. that's different? What do you do that's different than you used to do now that you found all this through research? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. People ask me this a lot because I'm, I'm deeply involved in the world of, the, for example, the science of human life extension. And everyone says, oh, you must be taking the NAD plus boosters and metformin and you must be like doing um, like the thing where they, they um, cut open the old and young mice and sew them together. You must be <laughs> doing that with I don't know who or your girlfriend or, or something. And I don't do any of that. Um, what I do is a, a few things. One, just in terms of my personal life, I exercise an hour a day and eat healthy and do all those blue, blue zone things yeah. that everybody knows you're supposed to do and are, are um, hard to do. Um, certainly in my health care, I try to get ahead of the curve because I write about the future of health care in the book. And where we're going is from our current world of healthcare based on population averages. You have a headache and you go to CVS and you pick up a Tylenol to our new world of healthcare uh, precision or personalized healthcare based on each person's individual biology because you know a small percentage of people who take a Tylenol will have a terrible adverse reaction and could even die. And so better to know you're one of those people before you take the Tylenol. And that's true for cancer therapies and, and all of that. So we're, and in that process, we're gaining a lot of information about systems biology, so the, the complexity of human biology. Right. And then we're, that's the next shift in our healthcare, which is from precision to predictive and preventive, where with all of this data and the formula for all of this stuff is the more high quality data you have, 
the more computing power, right. the stronger algorithms, the more we're going to be able to, to decipher uh, actionable patterns. That's going to change healthcare and industry and agriculture and everything. Amen. Hey, listen, do not go anywhere. Jamie's going to stay with us. Jamie Metzel, we're talking uh, with about his new book, Super Convergence, How the Genetics, Biotech, and AI Revolutions Will Transform Our Lives, Work, and World, Including a chapter on what possibly could go wrong. So we're going to get into that. That's coming up next. I want to get back to Jamie Metzl, Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council, Founder and Chair of the nonprofit One Shared World. We are talking about his new book out on Tuesday, Super Convergence, How the Genetics, Biotech, and AI Revolutions Will Transform Our Lives, Work, and World. He is still with us here in New York City. Hey, Jamie, um, one thing I wanted to ask you the way the book starts, you have two quotes, but you say, this is from Stuart Brand, we are as gods and might as well get good at it. Yep. What's the message there? I, <laughs> it feels pretty so powerful. For millennia, our ancestors imagined these all-powerful gods that could create new stuff. They could recast life. They could grant people's wishes to live extra life. They could transform the world around them. We can now do all of those things. So we are in many ways, not in all ways, in many ways, we are the all-powerful gods that we have imagined in our past. And just like we've imagined those gods can build and destroy, we can build and destroy. And so now we have these superpowers. And the question is, are we going to use them to build, to make a better future, for us individually, for our companies, for our countries, and for our world, and do it in really practical ways? Or are we just going to not do what needs to be done, not create the, the right frameworks and governance and values and accountability and all the things that are required to make sure this story has as happy of a process, because there's no ending process as possible, if we don't do those things, we're really going to be in trouble. And that's why I've, I've written the book. That's why I'm so passionate about bringing everybody into this conversation because it's in the early, when you're doing anything, starting a company, that's when you need to say, hey, here's what we stand for. Here are our values. Right. And then everything gets built on that. If we, if we don't have a conversation of what we're trying to achieve, who we are, and what are the core values that are going to guide us? If we make this a conversation just about the technology itself, we're going to wind up in a very unfamiliar and most likely scary place. I have to say, I'm already scared because I, I question the moral values and ethics that I feel like sure. people have really lost. Um, I want to ask you, genetics, biotech, AI, what worries the, you the most that we could get wrong? And there is a chapter about what could go wrong in right. general. And so that's what, let's go there. And I'll say in general and, and then specific. There is a reason why anxiety has been preserved by evolution. Mm -hmm. Anxiety is actually a really healthy emotion for us and for every animal. Uh, because we're afraid of things. And that is what inspires us to say, hey, this terrible thing could happen. I could be eaten by some horrible animal. So I'm going to start planning so that that doesn't happen. And so these fears that we have, I mean, there are some people who are just such techno optimists. They say, just do nothing and the future is going to be great. That is not true. Bad things could happen. We need to be honest now about, about what they are. A few of them that I highlight in, in the book, one, as I, I mentioned, um, I was a member of the World Health Organization Expert Advisory Committee on Human Genome. And Dr. Tedros, the director of the WHO, created that after the the world's first CRISPR babies were born in China mm -hmm. in 2018. That was a terrible violation. If we just say, hey, let's just do whatever willy-nilly human experimentation, we're going to wind up with more Nuremberg trials and those mm -hmm. kinds of, of violations. We have the capacity to use gene drives, which is basically we weaponize, um, we, we, we put a little molecular scissors almost um, into the sex cells that mm -hmm. pass between animals. And we could use it to wipe out malarial mosquitoes. And that would be great. We could save a million lives per year. But we don't know how these full ecosystems work. And if we're not careful, we could also crash whole ecosystems, not because we're trying to do harm, but because we're trying to do good. And as you, as you, you and I have talked about this before, Carol, yeah. uh, but I've been in the middle for the last almost four and a half years of this debate about COVID-19 origins. And right. it's my view that that the preponderance of the available evidence suggests a research-related origin in, uh, in Wuhan. 
Um, so, and it's very likely that these Chinese scientists who weren't trying to create bioweapons, but were most likely trying to create a pan-coronavirus vaccine and had an accident and didn't realize what had happened, and then things got, got uh, worse and worse. So it's not just that we're going to have Dr. Evil doing bad stuff. It could be that well-intentioned mm. people, mm -hmm. people who are mm -hmm. trying to uh, prevent terrible diseases or to stop malarial mosquitoes or all sorts of things. And that's why, again and again, I keep going back to values. Right. It's establishing well, well, the North Star. Where are we heading? That makes us think about, Tim and I talk a lot about AI. Yeah. So, Jamie, my question for you is where, where could AI go wrong and, and where what are the indications now about the direction that it's moving in? Yeah. So this is it's such an important question. It's the same question. As we speak today, Pope Francis um, has gone from Rome to Puglia for the G7 summit. And the reason he's gone um, is to participate in the conversation about the about ethics and the future of AI. So AI, like all of these technologies, can be used for good or for ill. And we're seeing both of those things right now. Um, we're seeing AI being uh, applied in healthcare settings, in agriculture, and all these other areas in companies, and it's helping solve real problems in very practical ways. And we're seeing deep fakes, manipulations, um, all kinds of, of problems with AI, and these are just the, the early days. And right now, when people think about AI, most people think, oh, AI equals chat GPT. Like, I'm going to go to this website, and then I'm going to do AI. But if I were to ask you guys, how did electricity influence your life today? It's an unanswerable <laughs> question, because electricity, it's in your alarm clock, it's in your house, it's in your air conditioning, it's in the microphone, it's in our clothes, it's in our haircuts. It's just electricity is part of everything that we do. And these technologies are going to be part of everything that we do, part of our accounting systems, our interacting systems, how we uh, interact with the world, how everything is uh, is made. Right. And that's why we need to think systemically and systematically about about these uh, these technologies. It's and there are some of these people who say, oh, just no regulation, yeah. government get out of the way. That's the last thing we need. We need wise governance and wise regulation. Yeah, everything, well, my dad used to say everything in moderation. I know everybody's dad says that or mom says it's that, but, but it's also everything, like you gotta have some oversight <laughs> of yeah, all the stuff. True. It's um, true. Jamie, good luck. So much fun to catch up with you again. Uh, thank you so much for finding time for us uh, once again here at Bloomberg. G Jamie, take care, be well. And good luck also in the future ultra marathons. I know, he's pretty impressive. I love, I highly recommend you check out that YouTube video because uh, he really does go through so much of the book. And like I said, it's raining, there's mud. Uh, Jamie is, of course, senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, founder and chair of the nonprofit One Shared World. Check out his new book, Super Convergence, How the Genetics, Biotech, and AI Revolutions Will Transform Our Lives, Work, and World. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine, plus global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenebeck on Bloomberg Radio. It is Bloomberg Business Week. Well, we talk about alts a lot, alternative investing. What about so-called alternative MBAs? Do you, what about say, it? you want to say it again with your microphone? <laughs> I'm going to turn my mic on. Okay. It's been one of those days. Well, as Bloomberg Business Week contributor uh, Rob Mandelbaum wrote in a recent story for Bloomberg Business Week, development of alternative and online MBA programs are in vogue today as traditional business schools simultaneously grow more expensive and less popular. I kind of get this story in a big way. One company offering such a program is the corporate training firm Ability, which has a comprehensive business skills course that's stylized as a 12-week MBA. The program is built around simulations of real-life business and management decision-making. We've got with us the CEO of Ability, Bjorn Bilhart, is here in the Bloomberg Interactive Brokers studio, along with Dimitra Kessanides, who's Bloomberg News senior editor, the editor on the piece that I just read from, by mm -hmm. the way, from Bloomberg Business Week contributor Rob Mandelbaum, who wrote about this. Um, Bjorn, I do want to start with you because you got your MBA at Harvard Business School. Like, let's be honest, there's that's like the <laughs> epitome of the MBA. It doesn't get any more like traditional MBA than Harvard <laughs> Business School. Um, but you're also quick to point out that your program isn't supposed to replace a, a traditional MBA. Who's it for? Yeah, it is not supposed to replace a Harvard Business School. Uh, in fact, I should I should say that I got the best ROI out of Harvard Business School as I met my, my, my wife there. So <laughs> I uh, I've. 
have fond Nicely memories. Nicely said. That, Nicely that, done. That one is good, yes. I, I have fond memories of my two years. Uh, but the, the truth is there are, in the U.S. right now, 150,000 new MBAs every year and over a million new management positions. Mm -hmm. So close to 90% of new managers never set foot in a MBA in the hallowed halls of Harvard or other MBA uh, uh, schools. And so there's this huge gap of people that have an undergraduate degree in history and biology, but are moving into corporate jobs and need to understand what an income statement, what a balance sheet looks like as they become a leader of people. Um, they need to understand how to manage others. They need to understand how to collaborate in cross-functional uh, uh, projects. And so there's this need uh, where 90% of the people moving into these leadership roles don't have the time, don't have the energy to get or a two-year MBA. Or the money, MBA. perhaps. Or the money, exactly. Dimitri, I want to bring you into it. That's you follow, you cover, you, you know, report out and work with the team to like cover everything and anything when it comes to MBA programs around the world. When this came across your desk, when you're talking to Rob, what is it that you wanted to know about? in kind of what is going on. And what do you want to ask our guests? Yeah, I mean, the first question was, are you, are, what are you intending to do? Because you're calling it the 12-week MBA. Um, but beyond that, it was really to get a better sense of what can you reasonably teach in that period of time? And how can you do it? Um, they're doing it you know, um, largely online. Uh, you know, wh what are we going to see in the way of these programs? Because I think there is, it's not just the number of positions that Bjorn mentions, there's the interest and the desire to, uh, to move into those positions because of the potential that they offer for earnings and more. And yet business schools are incredibly expensive. Right. So, you know, what, what can you actually train for in the way that you're training? And is that really going to make a difference when they land in that job? Is it actually going to serve them? It's a great question. And the truth is in 12 weeks, it's also not just 12 weeks, it's part, it's part time and it's virtual. So it is a very short certificate program. Um, it's not a full MBA, of course, it's a, it, it, it is not meant to be. Um, the truth is though that most people don't need all of the things that you learn in a two year program in business. This is not like law school or medical school where you don't want a lawyer, you don't want a doctor operating on you uh, without a full degree. Right. Um, it is very clear that there are a lot of uh, business leaders that are extremely successful without ever having had an MBA. So unlike those other professional certificates, there isn't necessarily the need to learn two years worth of study. And so for many people who don't have the luxury of going back to an MBA, there's an alternative. To build on what Demetrius said, though, are these the people that aren't going to be CEO, but are going to be other type of managers? Like, who is this for? It's for anyone that is moving into leadership roles in companies or is planning to move into leadership roles over the next, you know, five, ten years. So is it like an executive, you know, program? Like, I, you know, I remember Columbia, yeah. like working at Columbia, and like that was a big part that they would bring people in from companies who did, I can't remember how long it was, a few weeks or a few, I don't know, yeah. like a one a summer or you know, something. Yeah, or like every yeah. Friday, you know, once a month kind of thing. So is it like that? It's like that, but it's not for executives, right? So the executive MBAs are very expensive. They're twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars sometimes. This program is two thousand dollars. So it's a it's huh. the price of a conference that someone can go to. So it's meant for people that are not at the executive's level level at the executive level yeah. yet, but um, that are thinking about maybe becoming a team manager or are, are starting to manage others, starting to get into leadership roles where understanding an income statement balance sheet is becoming more important. Right. I do want to know about the content of the courses because one thing that I found so interesting about Rob's piece, Bjorn, is the gamification here and the idea that you're sort of competing with other folks and AI is kind of the backdrop here. Um, explain what the coursework is because it's, it's not necessarily what you'd find in a, a quote unquote traditional business school. Yeah, and I think that's the other disruption that I think is happening now. Uh, so in the in the twelve week MBA, there are no lectures, there are no powerpoints, uh, there is no e-learning. Uh, in those twelve weeks, you're actually in a simulated environment where you become CEO of a company. You have to compete with others in virtual teams, and it's yeah. super fun, super engaging, and allows you to see business from different vantage points. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, from v vantage point of CEO, vantage point of uh, VP of sales operations, um, and learn by doing, learn by making mistakes, and then having a facilitator who comes in and points out 
what mistakes were made as the teams competed with each other. A facilitator being another person, or is this like a, an, a, another part of AI? N no, there's actually real, th these, actual these are not person. AI facilitators, it's actually okay. real facilitators. So we, we actually have a lot of business school professors as well as retired executives that teach in the Smart. curriculum. Smart. And, but everything is all entirely online and remote. I mean, what, what are you, are they missing something by not having that sort of in-person human element? I mean, even schools today that have had very successful online programs, they're trying to find a way to incorporate something where the people are coming together. There's something that comes from being live and in person right. with either some of your classmates or your instructors. So what do you think about we that? We have a corporate culture that certainly safe to say our boss, like w that's part of what we do. We run into p you know one another from different right. departments. That is such a big part of what we do here. You know, it's a fantastic question. And we actually started the 12 week MBA as an in-person program. And then when the pandemic hit, we uh, didn't have a choice wow. of moving online. But what's really interesting and fascinating, this fall, we're actually moving part of it back into the classroom. So we're going to have a capstone experience um, that people can fly into. We're based in Austin, Texas, so it's gonna be in Austin, um, at least the first one, uh, but we're gonna actually uh, slightly modify the curriculum from an all online curriculum to have at least one weekend where people get together and have that in-person experience. And that was based on, was it feedback? I mean, again, a feeling that there's something that they're missing out on when they're not in person. Yeah. And there's an aspect of this education that really does need to, you need to connect with people. Yeah, I think so much of education is social. Um, it's the difference between Agreed. knowledge transfer and education is actually that social environment. And there's some of it that you can recreate online, and I think we've done a pretty good job creating some yeah. of these virtual simulations and competitions, but there's something that is so important uh, about this human element when you're in person, when you're at the bar after the, after the competition and you can debrief with your peer, and so we want to bring that back. Quick question, Bjorn. Um, we have about a minute left here, 30 seconds left. Um, are you seeing the AI part of this, the simulation part, are you starting to see that being incorporated in this quote unquote traditional MBAs in, in business school? Some of it. So traditional schools are a little bit slower to adapt some of these new technologies. Uh, so t uh, universities teach AI, but they're actually not incorporating a lot of AI into their curriculum. And uh, we have in our simulations AI characters now that you have to interact with that mm -hmm. also give you feedback. It's all controlled also by the facilitator. So there's always a human there, mm -hmm. but AI is part of these part of the educational experience. 10 seconds, will you accept anybody who applies or will you say, well, maybe this isn't a program for you? Real we quick, do quick. have an application process and there are people that we say, this is not for you. We want, make, we want to make sure that when people come to us, they get something out of the curriculum, but we're not Harvard Business School, so uh, we don't have, uh, you know, we, we, we don't have criteria like, uh, yeah. you know, you don't have to have, for example, even an undergraduate degree. Very or cool. take the GMATs. Or take the GMAT. <laughs> <laughs> thanks to Bjorn Bilhard, CEO of Ability, and Dimitra Kessanides, who is Bloomberg News Senior Editor. 